Released in December of 1984 in arcades, Marble Madness is an isometric maze racing game produced and developed by Atari. One or two players use trackball controls to roll their marble along the isometric maps, racing to the course before time expires. It was inspired by the art of M.C. Escher, as well as the game of miniature golf. Along the way, players are challenged by ramps, jumps, marble munchers, acid puddles, hoovers, and the infamous Black Steely. With six boards, practice, beginner, intermediate, aerial, silly, and ultimate, Marble Madness is not a long game so much as one of mastery and high scores. The game was Atari's first title written in the C programming language and ran on Atari's new System 1 architecture, a modular hardware platform also used for titles such as Road Blasters and Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Because of this modular design, swapping marquees, controls, and cartridges allowed for one game to be converted to another without needing a complete cabinet replacement. In addition, Marble Madness was the first coin-op video game to make use of FM stereo sound, highlighted by a memorable soundtrack by the late Brad Fuller. An enhanced version of this pattern, System 2, would be released years later with titles such as Paperboy and Super Sprint. The version we played, a port for the NES, was actually produced by Rare, who used the isometric viewport for a number of titles over the era. You can't really discuss Marble Madness without mentioning its lead designer and graphics programmer, Mark Cerny. A veteran that grew up playing Atari 2600 games, Mark was a young man, just 17, when he quit college and developed Marble Madness as an employee of Atari. It would come out a little under two years later. Success has followed Cerny throughout his career, including Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Kid Chameleon, Dick Tracy, Gravatar, Major Havoc, Crash Bandicoot, Jack and Dexter, Ratchet and Clank, and Spyro the Dragon. In 2004, he won the Lifetime Achievement Award at the Game Developer's Choice Awards, and for years he's helped codify the Cerny method into practice, where software development teams take exploration and risk early when creative freedom can yield results before the demands of schedules overtake them. Most recently, Mark was lead system architect for the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita, an unstoppable legacy that started, appropriately enough, with a marble rolling down a hill. Thoughts? All right, well, two things. First of all, it's pronounced Jack and Daxter. Daxter? But, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Daxter. But secondly, uh, with all the games that Mark Stoney was a part of, was he actually with Naughty Dog? Then, because a lot of those last titles were all Naughty Dog games. Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter, That's Crash Bandicoot. Point. I, I he might have been. I know he was, you know, with Sony for years, and they have a pretty close relationship, especially because the Uncharted stuff. Right? Was he a part of Uncharted at all? Um, I can I can take a quick look and see, but I don't believe Uncharted is amongst his uh, his credentials. Yeah, I, I feel like he would have included that one if if he was. Yeah. Sony just looked at him and was like, "Hey, you're basically like." Mr. PS1. You want to help us with the PS4? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, so he went from Atari, he he went over to Sega and worked for Sega for a while, and he did some Master System games and some Genesis games, and he was actually real early on the Sony bandwagon. I think he got in there, like, on the ground floor. He might have been one of the first American developers to work with Sony. And, it, I mean, it shows. He's been with them for many, many years now. He's made a ton of games I've enjoyed. Yeah. <laughs> So. That's the face of success right there. <laughs> <laughs> that really is. He knows. <laughs> I wonder if we can just superimpose that in there real quick. <laughs> it's like, I'm Mark F. and Cerny. Just have it slide up the screen all nice and slow. All right, so yeah, we're uh, looking at this games list. Um, yeah, he is a, uh, he's a design consultant for Uncharted. Okay, well, there you go. Um, as well as God of War 3, Killzone... Knack? What Death is that? Stranding? Is, is that that's the, the super yes. Weird oh yes, Kojima he is one. connected with uh, Kojima in Death Stranding. Huh. That's, the, that's right. the weird one with what's his face? Uh, Norman Reedus. Yeah. Yeah. The oily baby and all that. Yep. Uh, someone was telling me I need to play Disruptor earlier. Yeah. So I mean, he's got this track record that just spans. I mean, really, the history of games being in households in America, I mean, from the early 80s onward. What is Dick Tracy? I have never played the, that the, game. The movie? Comic? No. I've, what is Wait, it? was it a movie before it was a comic? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, it was a comic well before it was I'm a movie. Um, I just, I think of the Warren Beatty movie when I think of Dick Tracy, because I just, I loved it. But what is the game? Yeah. I have no idea. Um, I've never played it. I just remember the comics, I'm wondering why he never smiled. <laughs> I mean, he was a cop. He was, I, he had to play the, uh, is he had to play both the good cop and the bad cop. A, a jaded cop who spent way too much time on the force. He doesn't know how to smile anymore. 
He took his smile. Hard by the streets. <laughs> so, when I first played Marble Madness, and this is, I, I we got our copy in like eighty eight or eighty nine. Um, one, it's one of the few games I was actually able to get my father to play, which is a miracle because um, he won't play games otherwise. Uh, for some reason, he held the controller upside down and insisted it was easier to play the game with an upside down controller. I've yet to uh, to try to beat the game doing that. Um, <laughs> that seems way harder, but okay. Yeah, but... Um, <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm used to holding the controller the right way because it's the right way. You, you <laughs> think? Well, I like left being left. Well, I mean, like, you try... Right. I remember before we recorded the episode, and this is back in December... Um, you tried the 45 degree angle controls and yeah. it was just a, a disaster to watch. I mean, the 90 degree <laughs> controls made so much more sense once you actually try them. But because this was a trackball game in the arcade and it's, you know, translating it to, um, the D pad is kind of weird, but you know, I, I, upside down, I can't imagine. Maybe um, he held upside down because he was that pro. Like maybe, uh, maybe that's why. Maybe that's why he doesn't play games anymore. Because no, not after that was my life. Maybe that was my whole life, never again. That's just it, his uh, his yellow trick shot method for <laughs> beating Marble. If Madness. he did, he was a tremendous father because he hid every ounce of that skill from me while we were playing. Um, he just always played with upside down controllers. Now, no slopes. Aaron mentioned we were we were also joking at the beginning of the episode. Aaron mentioned um, too many ports. So I decided to make sure that I got the complete list of ports, and if I've got this correct, the Amstrad CPC series, the ZX Spectrum, the Apple II, the Atari ST, the Commodore Amiga, and Commodore 64, DOS, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, Sega Game Gear, Genesis, Master System, Windows, and the Fujitsu FM Towns. What is Did the you complete? Me? Uh, it was a popular computer. Well, popular it was a semi-popular computer in Japan. Doubled as a scanner. Um, <laughs> but the Commodore one, the sixty-four, apparently had a secret water level in it, which is interesting. I'd love to just go dig into that. I'll see if I can't pull a screenshot of it for the uh, for the um, review here. Where was the outrage but... at the console exclusive? <laughs> Truth. <laughs> Although my guess is a lot of these ports were done by EA. Some of them were done by other third parties. Uh, the one we played, uh, the NES port, was actually done by Rare. Um, Which is probably so, why it was good. Yeah. Oh, no, <laughs> it was it was excellent. Some of the other ones out there, like we've, we've looked at them a while back, they are not good. They look like the same company that made, like, Rodent's Revenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and some of that is the difficulty in porting the, the code over, because it was written in C, which makes it a very extensible language, but it also means that you have to find a way to translate into some lower level, like, assembly or basic code or whatever some of those older systems are running, so it can be a bit of a hang-up. Um, what else? So, so you were telling me actually. I I know you said that this website isn't relevant anymore, but you actually ranked really highly on a website with your last run. Oh, of Marble Madness. The, um, so yeah. So <gasps> at the end of the Marble Madness episode, I promised to come back and play this again and try to uh to try to get a good score. I've got footage of it, and I'll tack it on to the end here. But I I came. So stay tuned. Really close. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the the, the best parts at the end. Uh, I came really close to what might have been a world record type run. Um, I say that jokingly in the sense that I think there are two other people that have submitted scores to Twin Galaxies for this. <laughs> um, so best of three. Third yeah, best. Right. Still, still third best. But um, it, it was. I had gotten multiple wands in the run. And everything just kind of fell into place perfectly. R and Jesus was on and, your side. And, oh yeah, and I, it was well over a hundred thousand was the final score, but I think the world record for the game is somewhere around one hundred and eighty. Oh yeah. And a lot of the score competition for this is the arcade version, not the NES port, obviously. Oh, fair enough. So oh, true. you know, it's it's like you can go into play. Yeah, I'm the uh, I'm the world record holder for Marble Madness. Oh wow, really? That's amazing. On the ZX Spectrum. <laughs> On the <laughs> Fujitsu FM Towers. Oh. I you have a working one? That, like that's still around? If you if you go looking for uh, competitive communities for this for this game, do they separate it by system? I, mean, I guess you'd have to. Yeah. Wouldn't you? In fact, um, I was digging through the Twin Galaxies records. We played. Um, when we played Pinball Dreams, 
they actually have separate record boards for the PAL and NTSC versions of the game. Oh, wow. Huh. Even though they essentially play the exact same. Would it be like a, like a latency issue with one versus the other? I mean, the it's, they're, they're that specific about it, right? It's, it's right. They want to get all the way down to, you are this version of the game for this console, for this region, like, exact versions of stuff. So, yeah, they're... Um, Although they're going through a bit of soul searching right now because they can't figure out if they want to have everyone like record their own videos and save them on Twin Galaxies websites or link to YouTube videos or or how you record it nowadays. I don't think they've quite caught up to the Twitch and YouTube gaming kind of new generation of recording all this stuff. And so they're going to have to kind of figure out what they want to do with their scoreboards going forward. They may not be super modern, but any twelve-year-old out there with a with a camcorder is making v- game videos. Yeah, these days, so it can't be that hard to do something legible, you know. I don't know. That's just my thought. Sure. But I mean, a game like I mean, a game like this is one hundred percent lends itself to competitive play like that. I mean, speed runs and all that crap, trying to find the most. Yeah, I don't know, efficient paths, I guess. I don't know. It's like the whole point of speedrun, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, <laughs> well, no, 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 I'm, I'm agreeing with you. You know, I'm agreeing with you, but it, yeah, you're right. It lends itself perfectly because the the idea is to get there with the fastest possible time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 ninety percent speed and a ten percent accuracy because when you get to the end of the game, you'll see this in the video. Um, you get penalized for every time you fall off the edge. So your score is based on how much time's remaining when you get there. After every level, you get, like, your bonus is 100 points times how many seconds you have left, I believe. And that gets tallied up over the six levels. Um, In addition, you get a penalty for how many times you have fallen off the board at the end. So if you have, like, a score of 150k, but you fell off 20 times, it drops you to 130k. Oof. So a major part of getting a high score in Marble Madness is not falling so yeah the the speed run thing is definitely part of it and obviously dropping off of the edge is going to cost you but just as much with marble madness it's um it's a score based thing which is nice because it lends the score almost lends itself to being a quantifiable way to judge skill in the game because the game's not just about getting there as fast as you can it's getting there as fast as you can without falling as well right so what i want to see is when you say competitive play I want to see, like, two nerds sitting there with, like, their Doritos and Mountain Dew, like, and, like, really into it and, like, throwing their remotes at the screen whenever someone, like, bumps them off the no, map no, or no, something. No, they've, they've, they've got their $200 Mad Cats trackballs. <laughs> MLG <laughs> Marble League Gaming. Yeah, 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 World Series of Gaming. Uh, Marble Madness is, like, those dudes that have, like, 30,000 followers on, on Twitch who just do nothing but Marble Madness all day. I got 30,000 they... people that do nothing but stare at my ball. <laughs> hey, guys, Marble fans seven. 82 here <laughs> <laughs> oh man so i actually had a question for you dan since you did the most recent kind of grinding on this game sure the placements of the enemies and the acid pools and all that kind of stuff is that set or is that random it is set i can't tell and i haven't really got into it enough to know if the movements of them is random or predictable right but their initial positions are predictable and on top of that they don't move very quickly so with the exception of the Black Steely, most of them are pretty easily avoided. The, the Black Steely is the one that just chases you down. Yeah, right? that's that's, that's the Black money. Marble. Yeah, so um, the others are pretty negligible. The vacuums are always in the same places, and if you're going full speed, they don't really move you enough to matter. Mm-hmm. Um, if the acid pools catch you, it's because you took too long to get to them, because when they initially spawn, you know where they spawn, and there's usually a clean lane you can kind of just sprint through. So if you're doing a clean run, you can get around the acid no problem as well. Uh, the only thing you tend to worry about is um, there's a couple of black steelies uh, that present an issue. Um, the main one is the one in Ultimate Race, right on the other side of the ice path. Um, I got both lucky and unlucky in our run where I, Matt mentioned it, like I clipped right through the black steely when I rolled through it in Ultimate, but then fell right past him and into the pit and then the next time um i got across i fell again uh because i at that point you're you know the adrenaline you're rushing you're trying to get to that end gate um and with those appearing and disappearing panels in that last part it's like if you don't have 30 seconds to kind of just relax pace yourself and time those um those parts it can be a pain although the bottom part of that is easily the worst it goes to two uh two block wide in like an s pattern 
the last two ramps after that, once you get to the actual bottom of the screen, the ramp up into the right and then the ramp up into the left, those are both four wide and they're fewer panels. They're actually not nearly as bad. Um, actually, no, I think the one up into the left is still too wide, but either way, it's it's much easier to traverse those than it is the um, the S uh, zag on the, uh, the, when you're going from the left of the screen to the bottom of the screen there in that little kind of circular drain bit. Um, last thing I wanted to mention is the music for this game. It's, it's all done by, um, Brad. Uh, Brad was still with us when we recorded this in 2015, but unfortunately I found out that in January, 2016, um, Brad Fuller had passed away, uh, at the age of 63 from pancreatic cancer. Um, he was a graduate of Berkeley school of music and was a member of Atari for a number of years and did a lot of their music. From a historical perspective, he's the first guy to do true FM stereo music for an arcade game. Oh, wow. And so it's, you know, it's it's sad to see. I mean, 63, obviously, still way too young to, to go. This review goes to you, Brad. But, so, yeah, um, just <laughs> thoughts and wishes, you know, with, his, uh, with the Fuller family and everybody, you know, that... It, I mean, it's great music, especially the um, those first couple of levels. Definitely, I'm practice and beginner both. I guess you say it's quite the baller soundtrack. Oh my right? God. Oh. Aaron, please. I had to get one. Oh. <laughs> but um, have you no shame? <laughs> we'll edit that out. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> no, we won't. No, we won't. Nope, that's it. Um, yeah, thanks, Brad. That was. But yeah, for everything you did, man, that was so, awesome. Uh, any last thoughts before we just go ahead and kind of close up the episode? Uh, Matt, you got any ball jokes you want to throw in there? <laughs> you already, we already made one. I've already, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> just one? It. I've hit my quota. Just one just, ball? Just, just one, one ball? <laughs> just one. <laughs> uh, this was a fun game to play, of course. I'm, I'm obviously, I'm not very good at it because I've never, I don't have the playing experience that, of course, Dan here does. I have not does. been playing it since before I was born, so. <laughs> <Clearly>. Right. <laughs> so, no, but, but it's absolutely fun. It, I can see why people might get, you know, competitive with it because it's just, a, it's an easy game to just fall into and it's, it's not hard to, to want to keep going just because there's always a, a better score, a better time. There's a lot you can improve on. There's a lot of kind of goals to try to achieve there, which is great. It's yeah, it's a lot not, of fun. not something you see a whole lot in games these days. And anything competitive these days is directly PvP, more or less. I mean, even most platformers like this, like the challenging ones, the controls are a lot tighter. But, I mean, this game, you have to remember, yeah, you, <clears throat> you're using a D-pad to simulate a trackball, so the controls are a lot more sluggish. Mm-hmm. And so you don't really, you're, you're fighting the controls half the time that you're fighting with the stage. Maybe that's why you turn the controller upside down. Ooh, <laughs> I think about that. <laughs> so when you're pushing up, it's really to go down like you're pushing up on the ball for it to go down. I don't know. Right and left. Maybe we can just, <laughs> maybe we can just take our, a port of this game, go to the nearest bar, and plug it into Golden Tee, and just use their trackball. Is that, is that an option? <laughs> that is, well, no, because Golden Tee is not a System 1 game. Damn it! Yeah. If if Golden Tee was a System One game, we absolutely could have done that. But <laughs> oh well, I tried, man. Yeah. All right, well, that's all I've got. Oh, I, I've got something I need oh, no. to say here. Oh, no. Go for it. Okay, so this review <laughs> goes out about? to the copy of Marble Madness that Matt and I that Matt and I had as kids that got like tossed out at a yard sale for twenty <laughs> bucks for the system, the NES, and all the games. It was like twenty games. <laughs> twenty bucks. <laughs> I, I can hear all the people at so Nintendo weird. age, like the the real collectors, just crying, envisioning like there was a there was a gold Legend of Zelda cart in there. Dude, yeah. there was a lot of stuff. This was like twenty cents. This is worth more. Than no, I, I I can envision how it happened now. Like they were out selling it at the yard sale, all the collection. He goes, hey, how much for the collection here? Uh, one hundred and fifteen bucks. I, I don't know. You've got caveman games. All right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> fine, twenty bucks is yours. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I guess I can say though. I mean, it's pretty fair because this game was priceless to me. No, it was good. No, it was it was a great game, and then we, we had a lot of great ones for the for the system. But this one was definitely up there. Yeah, classic. Well, cool. Hope you all enjoyed. And join T Valor. No. Oh, <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us. Enjoy. <laughs>